Welcome to this service at Faith and Victory Church. This is the place to come to receive your miracle from God. Now, let's join our service already in progress. Hallelujah. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon the throne high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Just like, you know, it's, it's the train of the glory. It's just like a train on a wedding, wedding um, gown. Above it stood, uh, and his train filled the temple, and above it stood the seraphims. Each had six wings. With twain he covered his face. Twain he covered his feet, and twain he did fly. Now that's real, twain's two. Okay, that's King Jimmy for two. All right? So he covered his face with two wings, covered his feet with two wings, and flew with two wings. If you flew with one, he'd been kind of going in circles. That was funny. Come on, laugh. And one cried to another and said, Holy, holy, holy. Why are the three holies? Because there's three persons in the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Is the Lord, caps, that means Jehovah, Yahweh, the, the, different, the four letter word, of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. And then said I, Woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord, caps again, of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, having a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongues from off of the altar, and laid it upon my mouth, and said, Lo, this has touched thy lips, thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? And then said, I hear him, I send me. Now remember before he was, I'm, I'm undone. He got the, the, the fire of God and the cleansing presence of God cleansed him. And he said, now he's saying, here am I, send me. Before he's saying, oh, whoa, I'm undone. Okay? All right, now that's one extreme. You got the one extreme where people just feel so unworthy that God has to do a work in them. Then here's the other extreme. Now Moses kept in Exodus 3, 1, down through verse 11. Now Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he said, and he led the flock to the backside of the desert. And they came to the mountain of God, even to Orb, and the angel of the Lord, Lord again caps, you understand what I'm saying, the, 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 the word Lord in caps is the four Hebrew letters, Y-H-W-H, which we either uh, have turned into Jehovah or Yahweh, depending on which camp you're in. Either one would be accurate, because it's taking the four letters to make it pronounce, pronounceable. Y-H-W-H. The Germans took it, took, made the Y-I-J, added vowels, and so it became Jehovah, you know, because the V is a W in German. And then the other people took Y-H-W-H, Y-H-W-H, yeah, and put vowels in there and put A and, and put, made Yahweh. Same four letters, just two different camps to create pronounceable words, okay? So if you hear the word Jehovah and you hear the word Yahweh, it's this four letters that we can't pronounce Y-H-W-H in the Hebrew. Okay? So anytime you see a four letter cap for the word Lord in the Old Testament, that's what it is. Alright? So if somebody says Jehovah and somebody says Yahweh, they're both right. Okay? And, and as far as translation and making it pronounceable. Alright. Uh, and the angel of the Lord appeared in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush and looked and behold the burst burned bush burned with fire and the bush was not consumed and Moses said I will turn aside and see this great sight while the bush is not burnt and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see God called to him out of the midst of the bush and said Moses Moses he said here am I see you get cocky <laughs> he's got it together I mean Johnny Mr. Spiritual Cool alright and he said draw not nigh hither Put off thy shoes from thy feet, for the place wherein you stand is holy ground. And moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid. Now, a minute ago, he was saying, here am I. Next day, he's going, he's hiding himself. All right? 
He was afraid to look on God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt and have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. And I am come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of the land unto a good land, unto a large, unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites and the Pezzarites and the Hivites and the Jebusites and the Termites. <laughs> Just wonder if you all go catch that. All right, see if you all listening or not. Yeah, now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come up unto me, and I've seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Come now, therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. And Moses said, Who am I? That I should go into Pharaoh, that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt. Now, remember, Isaiah was sitting there looking at the presence of God. He said, I'm undone. He cleansed his lips. And he, now he says, I'll go. Moses showed up, Mr. Cocky. I've got it all together. I mean, he's, he's, the, he's Moses, man. And, God, and he gets up there, and now God says, I'm going to send you. He said, who am I? All right? What, what is this? It is the equalization of the presence of God. God. God will take you from whatever state you're in that's not usable to him and bring you into usability. Okay? His presence, His glory. So if you're all cocky, how about great you are, you walk around saying, how great I am, how great I am. God's going to bring you down. If you walk around, you know, saying I'm, you know, um, uh, nobody likes me, everybody hates me, think I'll eat some worms, then God's going to bring you up. God can't use the discouraged or the down and outer, nor can he use the cocky full of himself. He has to bring you to the place of pliability in his hands, whether it's exalting you because you've abased yourself so much or bringing you down because you've exalted yourself so much to the place now you have full dependence on him. And when you get to that place of full dependence on him, then he can use you. Now, there's a lot, now I'm going to say this, there's a lot of people out here who are really cocky who think that they're really successful and it's just that they're, they're, they're good at you know, using the world system of success and they're not walking in the success of God. They're not pliable in the hands of God. They're so full of themselves it makes, you, it makes your stomach turn. I went to a meeting one time and heard this guy preach. I thought it was pretty good. Saw him in the airport, tried to tell him something. He just he blew me off. I'm really like, well, you just lost any respect I even thought about having for you. Because in the meeting, I thought you had a good message, but I just found out you're so full of yourself that I don't even think there's an anointing on that. Go to the airport and see, and you're just, Mr., I'm so full of myself. Well, go look at yourself in the mirror and pat yourself on the back and tell yourself how good you are. Because I don't want to hear anything that you've got to say right now. Not until I see some humility in your life. Amen. You can't treat people like that just because you think you're somebody. Nor can you never be used of God because you don't think you have anything to offer. No, God, God's giftings. Now remember, uh, then Moses got all well. You know, he stuttered and he couldn't talk and all this. I mean, he went from Mr. Cocky to Mr. Stutterer. All right, okay. And then Paul was breathing out Acts nine. And Paul was breathing out threatenings and the slaughter against the disciples of the Lord. And went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them. Man, he's going to bring women. He's going to drag women in. Paul's not a nice guy. Saul, anyway. Uh, and um, bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? There's a lot of good stuff in that one statement. When, when the stuff's going on, you're not getting persecuted. Jesus is getting persecuted. And he knows how to fix it. And he said, who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus whom thou persecutest. Now remember, he's dragging men and women who are in that way to be bound. And Jesus took it personal. You don't want the head of the church to take it personal. He takes it personal. All right? I mean, it's kind of like, you know, in the natural sense, having Jack Bauer find out you take, it made it personal. You, you know, you don't want Jack to show up if it was personal. You don't want Jesus to show up if it was personal. Okay? Jesus took it personal. He said, you're persecuting me. And um, it's hard for you to kick against the pricks. And he fearing and trembling. I mean, I'm trembling and astonished. said, Lord, what will you have me to do? He said, go into the city. It shall be told thee what thou must do. So here we have... Paul, who's even outside the church, 
just, I mean, he's religious. So you got Moses, who's full of himself. You got Isaiah, who's, who's, who, who has abased himself. And you got Paul, or Saul at this time, who's just a religious zealot. And Jesus had to straighten them all out. Well, how did he do it? He did it. In, he did it in his glory. He did it in the presence of his power. Remember, a light shone shine from the noonday sun. Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up full of, as trained full of the temple. Moses saw the bush that didn't burn. It's the glory of God that came on that bush. And each one, coming from different places, came and ended up at the same place. Usable by God. Usable in the hands of God. Amen. Hallelujah. So we're, we're, we are, as Daddy Seymour said, prophesied back in the Azusa Street, somewhere in the about 100-year range of a, of a new revival. Now, I'm going to tell you something. There's going to be a new revival, but it's going to have to come on the church who's willing to get into the presence of God and let it change them. You may be sitting in church thinking you're not worthy to be used. You may be sitting in church thinking, I am somebody because I can quote, you know, quote the scripture faster than anybody. We used to have a family in church and they, had, uh, they would have get to the, uh, the, the ministries, children's ministry, and try to, out, you know, we're going to have Bible verse quoting who could say it first got the prize. And, and they spoke it so fast you couldn't even understand what they were saying. <laughs> Practice all week. I mean, it's super high. I mean, it's it, it warp speed. Quoting at warp speed. <laughs> You know, and I'm the best Bible quoter in the church, or I'm the best, you know, prophesier in the church, or I, I, I see more than anybody. <laughs> I've had people walk, you ever have spooky Christians come up to you? Oh, dear Lord. They come up and they give you that look, and it's like they're really deep. <laughs> And then they start talking, you think, oh, Lord, you don't even know, you, you're crazy. That's the uh, door that needs to be fixed. <laughs> yeah. Donnie? Uh, add it to the list. <laughs> add it to the list. What's that, the Donnie do list? The scroll. <laughs> scroll. Sling out, hit you with. <laughs> Actually, his list is on a flash drive. Is <laughs> okay. <laughs> but in order for God, see, we got, we got all these Christians who either don't have any confidence in themselves, too much confidence in themselves, or they got just a religious zealot. And what, what's happening? What are we missing? We are missing having visitations of God with his glory that corrects that. Because getting into his presence humbles you if you're exalted, can lift you up if you're abased and get you right with him if you're just a crazy nut. If you'll let the glory work. If you'll let the glory work. So we want, we, we need more manifestation of the glory in the church. Hallelujah. Are you here? We need to have more of, of God's presence at work in our lives. Hallelujah. Um, we, we need more... Randy Greer, remember, if y'all remember Randy came to our church about 2009, 2010, a couple times in that frame, and he was saying that there's, there's a coming separation in the church. Now, he used two terms. Now, I, I remember one of the terms, the informational church Revelation. and the revelational church. There, but thank you, brother. I could not remember that. I just could not remember that other word he was using at the time. The informational church was a church that was all about really head knowledge, what they knew, how great they are, you know, without the, without the anointing of the Holy Ghost. Revelation Church is walking in revelation from the Spirit, walking and leading me and led by the Spirit. In other words, one was drying up and just becoming wordy. The other was following the Holy Ghost. You still got the word in both. Or you, 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 one's claiming the word in one, but you've got to have the word no matter what, even if it's, you know, it's not just information, it's got to be revelational. And we saw it, take, we saw, he said in 2011 it was going to start. And boy, did we see it. And it's gotten worse and worse and worse. Some of it came on the teaching of, 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 of teachings where um, they, take, they, they took the subject of grace and just went crazy with it. Off the deep end about what you didn't have to do and how you lived under this special grace and God's love for you. And I'll tell you, people just keep saying stuff and saying stuff. And you, read, and you go by and you read, what? Shut up. You're just spousing stuff. That has no sense to it. Okay? 
He's saying stuff that makes that has no sense, may, has no foundation, and is causing destruction to people's lives. And, we, and so we saw that taking place. And now, now you got people who are. I mean, you got you got the church who's just everything is about them. You know, th th this is not about you. Amen. Oh God, came He came to reconcile you to the Father to fulfill your purpose, His purpose for your life. He did not come to reconcile you, come to bless you, come to endow you so you could bless yourself. He came to put you into the place of fulfilling his purpose. Now, his purpose brings blessing. His, his, his purpose brings uh, honor. His purpose brings a lot of things, but it is his purpose. It is not so you can run around and talk about how great you are and how much stuff you can get and how great this is and how, you know what kind of car you, we spent. You know the prosperity message got so far off. Dad had to come back and bring up write a book to try to straighten it out, yes. and people wouldn't listen. He, he, he tried to straighten a lot of stuff out. People wouldn't listen. I was in a meeting one year where they were um, um, went back when the Army of God thing was going on back in the nineties. They show up in army fatigues to church. They were renting helicopters to fly around the cities to do battle against the spirits in the heavenly places. Because you had to get up where the demons were to have be effective. You can think I'm joking. I am just as serious as a heart attack. That's pretty serious. Yeah. <laughs> Nobody ever said demons had wings. Well, the Bible says that they're in heavenly places. You know, the principalities, powers, and rules of darkness of this world. Spiritual wickedness in heavenly places or high places. But poor Jesus, he couldn't get up in the atmosphere and fight them. He had to do it from the ground. And I'm supposed to follow his example. Anyway, Brother Hayes started talking about this stuff. They got up right in the middle of the service. About 20 of them marched right out there. They were in the army fatigues. Came to church in the army fatigues. Went to the... Went to the surplus store and bought them so they could come in in fatigues and marched out like soldiers. <laughs> if you would be, stop being so stupid and come back and sit down, he could help you. All right? Now, see, the glory of God, see, see when you come in with, a, with, a, with an objective and the presence of God's there to bring correction and bring straight, to straighten out and do whatever it does, and we reject that, we miss out on our opportunities. Now, the church has got to come back, amen, to being full of the Holy Ghost, getting refilled with the Holy Ghost, being, being, being anointed by the Holy Ghost, hearing from the Holy Ghost, experiencing the glory in the church services so we can go out and be effective out there in the highways and the byways with those people who are need contact with the anointing. Amen. 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 You know, when you go through the book of Acts, they, they, they'd go out there and they could do stuff and when, some, when persecution came or when troubles came or when tribulations came, they'd run back to their own company, they'd pray, and they'd get filled with the Holy Ghost all over again. And then you have building shaking. We keep waiting for a building shaking service, but we're not doing what they did to get the building shaking service. What do you mean? Well, first of all, they were going out, ministering, getting people saved, getting persecuted. They came back, got back into one accord. Now, no one else cares about word of faith people. We'd have a Holy Ghost building shaking meeting, and everybody would try to come to get the building shaking, and we'd never go out and witness. We'd never get persecuted for witnessing. We'd not, not go through what they went through to have to have the building shaking service. But we want the building shaking service. You're not going to get the building shaking service until you're doing what they were doing. Hello? So they were, you know, they were, re they would be refilled. Um, God's presence wants to cleanse us of ourself. Not, no, listen, not just of sin. It won't, he wants to cleanse us of our the inadequacies in our life that are in inhibitions to us walking in his power. What do you mean? Isaiah came and saw the Lord high and lifted up. His train filled the temple. Saw the seraphims flying around the throne of God. And he cries out, I am undone. I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell amongst the people of unclean lips. And he said, woe is I, am I. What, was he usable at that point? No. 
He was not usable, crying out, woe, and undone. So the angel came, or the seraphim came, and took a coal and put it on his lips. He said, this has cleansed your iniquity. And then the Lord says, who will I send? And Isaiah steps up to the plate and says, you can send me. So what happened? From woe and unusable, God delivered him from himself and now could use him to speak and to prophesy and declare in his power. God wants to do the same thing for you. You say, I don't measure up. I don't have, you know, I'm, I'm not good enough. I'm not this. I'm not that. I don't, I don't have the gifts that so-and-so has. I don't have the gifts that so-and-so has. I, I go to service and listen to Tony Cook preach or teach with, you know, the three whatevers. Tony will come up with the three A's of this or the four A's of ministry or the five this of that. I mean, you know, I don't know if he's ever done a sermon he didn't have the five something or whatevers. <laughs> and you're sitting there going, how did he do that? Well, he, I mean, Brother Hagin used to have the three G's of ministry. Watch out for the three G's. The gold, the glory, and the girls. Tony came back to me and had added three more to it. How did you do that? I mean, I thought the first three worked real good. You know? You know, so I, <clears throat> I watched somebody like him. And I, boy, you could come out of one of his meetings and somebody said, Hey, Brother Ed, you want to come to? No, go get Tony. <laughs> I'm not at least being qualified to teach you know, uh, how to tie your shoes after that service. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is, that's his gift. And he, you know, but he's learned to walk in his gift. And listen, he is, a, he is a tremendous Bible teacher. But I still am anointed when I say humble in the presence of God to minister his word. But I'm telling you that when you, after you come out of a service like that, you just don't feel like you're, you're adequate. I, I mean, I really don't. I'm like... I mean, you, you go there, you get encouraged and built up in an RMAI meeting, and brother, they brought brother Tony in, they build you up, and you're walking out going, hey, woe is me. Yeah, woe is me. I'm just going to play his tapes at my next meeting. I can't teach anything. <laughs> Hello. One, one preacher who has a tremendous ministry, Jim Caseman, he started out his ministry just going to church. He'd get up on Sunday mornings and read one of Dad Hagen's books. Just read it. All right, this morning we're reading Prevailing Prayer to Peace. And he would just read 32 pages and say, okay, guys, we'll see you next week. Now, he got better. He grew. He matured. But, you know, you get in around the presence of God, God will, God will build you up. So God, God has to deliver you from yourself. And if yourself is, you're abased. If you're self-defeated. If you don't think you, you're, you measure up. If you don't think you have enough. If you, can't, you don't think you have anything to offer to give. God's presence and God's glory will what, elevate you to the place of usability. Now, on the other hand, you cocky, full of yourself, think you've got it all together, people. I don't need, I, you, you don't even need Jesus because you've got it all together. Now, I heard a preacher say this one time, and I, I mean, I, somebody that I, I really respected, but boy, it, it, it torqued me a little bit. They said this. They said, if the Bible wasn't real, if God wasn't real, if Jesus wasn't real, if, you know, all that wasn't real, I'd still live by faith because it works. And I'm like, you sent the worst message you could possibly send to the body of Christ. Well, faith, because faith works. No, 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 no. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. You remove God from it, you've removed, you've removed the power of it from it. You can't get full of yourself. That's like I said, you know, some of these preachers get so full of themselves. You know, I'm going to be honest with you. Jesus walked through the crowds and they were touching him. And, you know, you remember the thing we went through back in the 80s and 90s? Or uh, 80s at least, for sure. But some preachers get so full you can't get around me because... Oh. You young whippersnappers. We've got to protect the man of God. We've got to protect the anointing. Can't, his spirit is open at the end of the service. We got crazy. Oh, yeah. We had, we had guys, we had, we had the brute squad walking around to keep anybody from getting close to the pastor or the minister after they ministered or before they ministered. Because if you got to them before they ministered, you'd mess them up. Now, I don't like to engage in long conversations before I preach because you'll get me off a little bit. I, that's one thing. I'm not, that's not being weird, protecting the one. But if you come in and say, Pastor, how you doing? I'm not going to get some devil on me that's going to keep me from ministering. And then afterwards, your spirit is up. You might have a devil and you're just going to get, ain't no devil getting at me just because you got one. <laughs> Hello. We got, now, Brother Bill, you know I'm talking. We got crazy. Yeah, yeah? thank you. 
Yeah, <laughs> bro, yeah. <laughs> okay. But we got, we got this attitude that I'm the man of God. And we, we teach things out of that, like you got to give up to the higher anointing to get blessed. See, this is the Moses syndrome of here am I. I am on the scene. I am the man. No, you know, when I show up, or any preacher shows up, if you don't show up with the anointing and the glory and the power of God, go home. Because what you got ain't going to heal a gnat. Ain't going to deliver a termite. And if you try to deliver the termites, I'm going to slap you. Anyway, you, you know, you don't have anything in yourself that people need. You have to to bring them what you get out of your walk and relationship with God because that is what will set them free. And so Moses comes up to the bush. Hey, guys, the bush is burning, it's, it's, but it's not burning up. I'm checking this out. Now, see, Isaiah wouldn't have done that. Isaiah would have gone, what was me, what was me, what was me? But Moses goes, I grew up in Pharaoh's court. I've seen a lot of stuff. Watch this, guys. He shows up. The voice cries out, who are you? I'm Moses. <laughs> like, you didn't know I was Moses? <laughs> I was in a meeting out in Tulsa one time after church. And there's this guy walking around. And I turned to the lady beside me and said, now, now who's that? And she treated me like I was dirt. Well, that's so and so. He's an assistant pastor. I'm like, lady, I show up once or twice every, every year or two years or whatever. I don't know who he is. And she treated me like I was some kind of peon because I didn't know who that was. And it took a little bit not just to tell her off. Like saying, you know what? I fly out here to get blessed. I'm busy taking care of stuff out there in the field. I'm the district director helping Raymond take care of stuff. And, and then you will treat me like this because I don't know who he is. I don't know who he is. But that, that arrogance can get on you. You know? And it got on his wife. I'm like, come on. You know? I'm, I, I, I'm out here. I'm, I'm not living in Tulsa. I'm not going to church here on Sunday morning, Sunday night, and Wednesday night. I'm out there in the field. You know? Just be a little more gentle and kind and be humble. Well, well, that's my husband. He's one of the assistant pastors. I said, oh, okay. I, I would have said, I could, oh, okay. You know? Let me say, in some places, the they changeover happens pretty regularly because it's so big and people are going out and doing stuff all the time. But I was not happy. Because I didn't like the spirit behind that. The arrogance behind it. Moses shows, hey, I'm, I'm Moses. And the voice says, get your shoes off your feet, boy. This is holy ground. You know? Who do you think you are showing up here acting like that? This is holy ground. And then God starts talking to him, and he, he falls down, humbles himself. He's, he's afraid to even look now. I'm going to catch God up there. <laughs> we have to let God work us. And see, what happened is, when Moses left that place, he was now been brought down from his high horse of arrogance. There's one thing between confidence and arrogance. I'm confident in my God. I am not confident in me. Yeah. Amen. Amen? I'm a human vessel. I can make mistakes. I can miss it. But I'm confident in my God. And I'm confident in my God to fix it when I miss it. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. And so Moses left that place, and, and, and God humbles him and says, Now, uh, I, need, I need for you to go do this. And he's like, man, who am I? He, 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 he found out real quick, in, in, in contrast to God, he is useless without God's assistance, without God's presence, without God's anointing. So we have Isaiah brought up. We have Moses brought down. Now, in the church, we have, that, we have, those, people, we have those dynamics in the church. You've met them. They come to the church, and they are... They are Eeyore. They sit over in the corner and they just don't think they measure up. They won't look at you. They're hiding. You know, you don't ask for volunteers and you'd have to go get a crane to get the arm up. 
because not, not because they don't want to help. They don't feel worthy or equipped enough to help. And then you got the people who think they got it all together. They know everything. And they're always ones jumping in going, I got this. And mess, sometimes they mess stuff up. Now listen, listen. I'm talking about the ones who are arrogant. I'm not talking about those of you who, who've, who've learned to let God use you. And what God wants to do is to get us all to where we can all do whatever he needs for us to do in our part and our place. But it takes his presence. We spend so much time talking about you know, leadership and who can be a great leader. And if you can get people to do things that they wouldn't do before, you're a great leader. And I've seen people get people to do things before they didn't, couldn't do before. And it won't because they were leaders, because they forced them. They were coerced and, and, and strong-armed into it. Hello. Are they having fun by there? Okay. I, I hid the, 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 the snacks. <laughs> yeah. They got, they got paid snacks back there for the body shop, and so I, I hid those. I didn't keep my wife out of them. Anyway, they had oatmeal cakes, little, little Debbie oatmeal cakes. You can't get my wife around them things. I shouldn't say that in front of Melanie. She's going to go back there and throw me under the bus. <laughs> you know how many times I've been run over by that? I woke up this morning sore. I, I, Melanie's been throwing me under the bus. That's why I'm so <laughs> Hallelujah. All righty. What did they do in the book? Remember this. Uh, let's go to the, let's just think. In the book of Acts, they were all hiding in that upper room. Now you think about it. They're all up in the upper room hiding. Now Jesus is raised from there. They're all going there. They're praying, you know, after, right after he got crucified. They're all running and hiding. Peter's cussing and denying and all this kind of stuff. <laughs> Hello? Peter, uh, Peter thinks he's got it going on. I'll never deny you three times for the night's over. Then he started cussing. Why did he start cussing? Because the girl said, your, spe your speech betrays you. He said, bang, 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 and started talking like a sailor again. <laughs> Hello? And then he went out and cried because he knew he'd been had. But they're sitting in that upper room, and then a sound came from heaven, Acts chapter 2. As if a mighty rushing wind and filled all the place where they were sitting. And they appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire and sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they got so full, they just stumbled out on that balcony. They weren't afraid of the Roman soldiers. They weren't afraid of the crowd. They stumbled out on that balcony, and they're just speaking in tongues. And a crowd shows up of, of, of several thousand people, like 3,000 people. And they're going, what does this mean? Said, ah, they're drunk. And, said, and Peter said, well, you're not drunk like you think we are, because it's only, it's only 9 o'clock in the morning. He says in the King James, the third hour of the day, they, they figured sunrise about 6 o'clock. So the third hour, they started, they started counting the day at sunrise. So the third, been about nine o'clock in the morning. They would have been, that would have been an early start. If you're drunk at nine, you already had an early start, or a late night. Uh, okay, and Peter says, "We're not drunk like you think. It's only the third hour of the day. We know we hadn't, we hadn't been, had time to get up and get drunk, like you're thinking. But this is that which is spoken by the prophet Joel. Now here's Peter, the liar denier. Think about it. Peter is the liar denier. And what happens to him? got filled with the Holy Ghost, the glory came on him, and now <clears throat> and the reason he was the, the denier was he was afraid he was going to get thrown in jail like, like Jesus. So he denied knowing him in order not to be put, captured and put in jail. But when he got filled with the Holy Ghost, got into the presence and the glory of God, he's out on the balcony in front of all them people preaching to him. He didn't care what they thought. What happened? God took Peter Quick to speak, quick to act, bozo. Peter was a bozo when he came. He came. Tact did not possess it. When, he, when you said, Peter, you need some tact, he probably asked you how to spell it. And probably wouldn't know if that was the thing you sit in somebody's chair in school when they can sit on it. All right? Now, here we got Peter. Peter comes in, gets into the glory of God. Next thing you know, he's out preaching. In public, and 3,000 people get saved. Have another meeting a week later, got 5,000 more saved. Now, he had all 120 in the upper room. At the end of the first week of revival, they had 8,120 converts. And they're all filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. Glory to God. Amen. Amen. 
all because someone who was a base got into the presence of God and got exalted and got free of himself. And God began to use him. Now, we go down there a few years later, old 13 or so, I forget, I'm not exactly sure how many years in church, we have to go back and look at that. Paul shows up, and he's going around persecuting Christians. Going to kill them, enslave them, feed them to the lions, and Jesus shows up, knocks him off the horse. Because Paul's breathing out threatenings. He's got letters. He's, remember this? He was at Philip's stoning and was consenting unto his death. Held the coats of the men that killed, killed Philip. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? Don't you know we're having an afternoon service? Okay. So, yeah. So Paul's at, Paul sees Philip stoned to death. Stephen, Stephen thank you. Hey, Stephen. I, I kept saying, Philip, that's not right. You think they'll leave it running? Was it still going? Okay. All right. Stephen's death. Thank you for getting me straight down that. Stephen, Stephen, Stephen. Paul watches him, Saul get, watches him get stoned to death, consents to his death, and becomes, you know, he's arrogant about who he is. And Paul, remember when Paul argued to the Corinthian church about his status? You know, circumcised, they, they tribe of Benjamin. You know, he just goes and lists all of his accolades. He was full of himself. But Jesus showed up, the glory showed up, knocked him off the horse, and brought him down. And then Paul became the greatest preacher of the New Testament church. We, we're quoting Paul's revelation constantly today. But God, God had to bring Paul, Saul down from his place to use ability. Now, the church has to be effective. And in order to be effective, we're all going to have to stay full of the Holy Ghost. And stop letting all these little things. We got people who, got, who have natural issues that, that, that inhibit them. Most people's issues in, in, in functioning in the church are natural, psychological, their own inhibitions. They don't let the glory of God fix it. I am not an anti-therapy person. I just don't think therapy fixes 90% of the stuff it needs to fix. I think you need more of the glory than you do therapy. You need the power of God and the anointing of God working in you, setting you free from you. Some people therapy helps. A lot of times it does more damage than good to people. It messes them up. Okay? Well, you just don't know what you're talking about. I do know what I'm talking about. I've been around people who've had therapy. I've been around people who needed therapy who went and got their doctorates in therapy. And when they got done, they were, they, they, you think about talking about dangerous. They're going to try to help folk. <laughs> and they're more messed up than the folk they're trying to help. So I'm not, I'm not, I really am not anti. I think, you know, under the right circumstance, number one, your counseling has, needs to be nothetic. It has to be biblical based. It's got to be coming from the word. You're going to tell people they're going to walk in love. Yeah, you're going to have to forgive some folk. But they did such and such to me. I don't care. You're going to have to forgive them. Now, that don't mean you go back and put yourself under, under their whatever and let them do it to you again, but you've got to forgive them. Hello? And going talking to somebody tells you that you have the right to feel the way you do, not as a Christian. Because you're a new creature in Christ. You need to renew your mind. You need to stop letting your past control your future. Yes. You need to let, your, you need to let your, your, the word set your future in motion. And stop living on the, uh, the diet of, but they set, uh, the reason I'm like I am is because someone so did such and such to me. They ain't a person on the planet. They ain't had somebody do something to them. And you can all walk around and limp around on the, on the, uh, the weakness of that I can't get out of this and I can't get better because they did this to me. Jesus is bigger than them. Amen. And the word of God is more powerful than what they did to Amen. you. The engrafted word will restore your suke, your soul, your emotions, your mind. It will fix it. Amen. But the church is full of, we, we, we get people coming into the church who are looking for help, and they don't let the, the very thing that will help them help them.
God's word anointed with the glory of God fixing you. God can fix you. God can deliver you. God can set you free. Not only God can, God will. If you will allow the word and the anointing to work in you, he will set you free from you. Amen. What about what so and so? Don't worry about what so and so. God can, listen, there is a judgment day coming for people who did stuff to people and don't repent. Amen. They're going to have to answer to God. But you don't need to let them bring you down while they're going down. What do you do? You abandon the ship of the past and you jump on the rescue ship of Jesus, glory to God, and you let him work in you and restore you and fix you and make you what you need to be so he can use you for his glory. Amen. 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 I am telling you, Jesus can fix it. And he does it through his word and the anointing working in you. His desire is to fix it. And you can take someone like Paul who was turning women and men over to be crushed in the pits of the lions who wrote the greatest passage on love in the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Who declares that the love of God, into the church at Rome, he said the love of God has been shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Ghost. This is a man who persecuted and killed and murdered in the name of religion, but because he came in contact with the glory and he had a transformation of his life, he now writes about the love of God. With authority and power. Somebody say Hallelujah. And what we need when we come to church is becoming and expecting God's word and his anointing to, ra to radically transform areas of our life that are either abased or exalted and bring us into pliability and usability for his kingdom. Well, I'm never going to... No, let me say, stop saying. Do not say. I am never going to let that happen again in my life. I'm not going to trust anybody. You're going to have to trust. And what is that? That's a defect. And you're protecting yourself from hurt or whatever. You've got to learn that God can make you where you can trust people again and not get hurt. He makes you usable. Because what happens? People who get hurt and put up that wall, become, then they'll start doing stuff they shouldn't do because they don't want to let that thing get to them. It's something to get to them again. There's your therapy session. Let the love of God work in you. Amen. God wants to rain on you his glory. God wants to not manipulate you, but he wants to work you into pliability. He is the potter, you're the clay, and he wants to mold you into the purpose he has for your life. So what are you going to have to go? Here am I, use me. Lord, I'm exalted in this area. He'll bring you down. Lord, I'm abased in this area. He'll bring you up. And what happens when you get to there? Then you become usable. And then you get to be uh, put into his place. Amen. Now, I'll be honest. With you, I'm a little sad we don't have our, our full camera set up over here. Because I am telling you, I've, I've enjoyed watching Carrie be, just blossom since we got cameras. She has become the camera queen. She's the camera queen filming everything. <laughs> <laughs> She, they've been in our church for years, but it, when we got the cameras, she found her place. And it has been such a joy to watch. I mean, so we're going to get our cameras back up, okay? Just, just hang there, hang with us. Hallelujah. And, and then we, well, that happens with people. You watch people come in, and, they, and they, they're like, they're, you know, but God, you stay with God, stay with the Word, stay with His anointing. He'll, bring, he'll get you to the place you're supposed to be. And then when you get there, say, so, oh, praise God. It's the people who come in and think they're supposed to be taking my place. Yeah. <laughs> and we have them come in. You know? Well, I can preach as good as Pastor Ed. Or somebody's blowing wind up somebody else's script about how good they can preach. We, and it, listen, it's not just in our I saw it happening in our church back in Eastern Carolina. There was a guy on staff, an assistant pastor, and there were people in the church that when he preached, they were there early, they were up on the front row, and they would come tell you, I, you know, I love when pastor preaches, but I'm telling you, when so-and-so, I really get fed. And I rebuked the snot out of him one day. 
I say, who do you think you are? And saying that kind of stuff. The pastor, he's operating out from under the pastor's anointing. I said, you're putting him up in a higher place. And that person's backslidden, re rejects Jesus, mocks the blood of Jesus, told their ex-husband, you know, uh, said, I spit in the face of your God. That's the same person who used to sit under and say he was the greatest preacher she ever heard. Wrong spirit in operation. We've had it happen in our church. Somebody went to our church. We, they, when I was preaching there on the back row, when the other guy was preaching there on the front row, early. Amen and like crazy. <laughs> yeah. And I'm sitting there going, you know. So you think you, you, we, we've got to let the word work in us and the anointing work in us so that we all stay in that place of pliability. Mm -hmm. I didn't call myself to Greensboro. God called me. Yeah. Well, he might try it now. He's expanded that. God didn't, I didn't call me here. Quite frankly, it wasn't the place I would have chosen. Not, not that I don't like this area. It's just that, Amen. look, you oaky. <laughs> What you got out there? Tumbleweeds and stuff? All right. Engines? <laughs> Don't get mad. Don't get mad. My wife is Cherokee. I'm messing with him. All right. You keep hitting me with because I just say stuff. Mm -hmm. Melon just ran over me again. All right. I mean, but honestly, I, I, mean, I, would, I didn't look at the map and say, I want to go to Greensboro. I, but I didn't. Yeah, because you were here. I didn't know you were here then. Now I'm so glad because I got to be Melanie. <laughs> can you get the bus off me now so I can breathe? All right. God called. So it's not a matter if you can preach better than me. You know, I told somebody one time, I said, you need to watch that kind of stuff because you, uh, ask Miriam and Aaron how that worked out for them. Yeah. You know? We, well, God speaks to us too. Yeah, God said, yeah, but not like I do to Moses. <laughs> Whenever real good. God wants to bring the entire church to a place that the presence and the glory of God melts us into a single unit of usability. People don't get upset because they didn't get credit. People don't get upset because they didn't get to do this. People don't get upset because they didn't have this position. People don't get upset because of that. This and that and on and on and on and on. They're just interested in seeing God do what he wants to do through the, the, the organism of the church and in the local church and get the job done and people get saved people get healed people get filled with the Holy Ghost and when it's all said and done he who says I will not share my glory with any man will get all the glory God himself and we all stand there in our place because we've been humbled but brought up or we've been abased but brought up, or proud and brought down, we no longer care about us. We've become part of the body. And in that function of the body, we're just carrying out functions so the body can achieve its purpose. And now we walk in harmony together. To see God do great things in the lives of unsaved men and women. And transform them. Hallelujah. Well, Pastor Jeff, if you would just do this, it would change everything. If you would just do this. If you would just do that. Well, why don't you just let the glory work in you? Amen. I posted an article this week. It was a pretty good article um, called Divorce in Your Church. It was, really, it was really a good article. Y'all can go back and look at my Facebook page and see it. It's on there. It's good. It's not talking about you, you divorcing your church. It's talking about reasons people do and that, why they're wrong. I'll come here next week and say something you don't like. I probably said something some of you didn't like this morning. I know it did because I'm so hurting from the bus. <laughs> Hello? We, 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 this, these things happen? But when we have let the glory work in us, whether we're high or, 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 or low, and it brings us to this place of harmony, great peace have they that love thy law, for nothing shall by any means offend them. 
Think about living in lack of offense. Think about what our... That's a, I know people who left our church, and the reason they left, they were offended. The only reason they left, they were offended. Is that a song? It's a John, John Lennon song. <laughs> it's not a good song. Okay. Okay, I got rule. I've got rules in the church. Beatles don't come here, especially dead Beatles. <laughs> <laughs> Praise the Lord. If we grow and see the glory will have, uh, rid us of us. And if you're if you're if you're delivered from you, how are you gonna get offended? Right, that's right. Amen. If you're delivered from you, how are you going to get offended? And if you're not offended, even when stuff happens that the world would get offended about, you, just, you know, when I go outside in the rain, I get wet. When a duck goes outside in the rain, it just rolls off of them. And we need to be like ducks in the rain with offense. We need to be delivered from us. Amen. We trust that you were blessed by the Word of God and the flow of the Spirit of God in this service. If you would like to contact us, please write us via email at office at fbc.org or using our mailing address, P.O. Box 7752, Greensboro, North Carolina, 27417. If you would like to contribute to our ministry, please go to our website at www.fbc.org and click on the Giving Online button. Thank you, and may God richly bless you for your giving.